Good afternoon everybody and welcome to this afternoon's webinar with Dr. Patrick McManaway. My name is Kelly McCosker and I am um, here with Resource Consulting Services helping Patrick deliver the webinar this afternoon. Uh, you're all on mute at the moment so what, the, what we'll do is if you have any questions throughout just send a question send a question um, by typing it through and I'll receive that. Um, we're, we're going to um, have a, about a 45 minute um, webinar and we'll leave the last 15 minutes for time for questions as well so we'll be able to bring them um, and uh, Patrick can help us answer those at the end. I have with me I hope you can hear me if somebody could send a yes I hear you that would be great. <laughs> uh, I have with me Dr Patrick McManaway who's joining us from the UK today. It's the morning over there, the afternoon for us. Thank you for joining us Patrick. Kelly, thank you for inviting me into this. This is, mm -hmm. this is lovely to have this opportunity. Fantastic. And uh, Patrick will be presenting on uh, water today for us, um, talking about how to increase our health and productivity both in the home and on the farm with Patrick. So, um, and I believe you can see at the start we're going to just show you Patrick there so you uh, can identify him and as we get into the webinar he'll go to slides only just to help with um, making sure it delivers well and not taking up too much um, bandwidth for you. Uh, so fantastic, thank you for your messages, you can hear both of us, thank you Ray and everybody there. Uh, I guess uh, probably that's the main thing today that I will wanted to confirm. If, um, if I can hand over to you Patrick, I'll, I'll do that. All right, thank you so much. So good afternoon everybody and greetings to those of you that I already know and have met and um, also to those of you who are still, still to be met by me at least. Um, excited today to discuss uh, water whispering um, or water blessing, more subtle energy uh, interface with water. Uh, it's one of the most ubiquitous and easy access um, parts of our farming um, system to, uh, to to work with. Often because it's it's so ubiquitous, all the stock are taking water. Uh, if we're in an irrigation system, then obviously all of the uh, all of the land that's under production is, is going potentially to be irrigated by water, uh, not necessarily so in a grazing system, but nonetheless we'll tend to still have um, specifically designated stock water uh, sources. So water is really everywhere on the farm, of course it's also everywhere in the home, it's everywhere in uh, commercial and industrial uh, environments, so water is really one of the true universals um, that I get to look at, really regardless of the, uh, the nature of, of use of, of land or property. And I think it's also one of the easiest things for us to work with. Uh, we are such watery beings ourselves, um, and we're familiar with water obviously as, as, as the carrying matrix um, of biological life. So it's a very easy um, uh, substance or uh, target point for our, our focus um, even when we're beginning in, in this work and certainly as we uh, as we progress with, with skill and experience often tend to come back to water as, as one of the most useful and, and high leverage uh, things to look at uh, when, when we're working with subtle energies. So as Kelly says just to avoid uh, drop in bandwidth I'm going to disappear here um, and just leave you with the slides and then come back to you towards the end. So, <clears throat> uh, some of you have um, attended Quantum Leap workshops, um, some of you have attended two, I know some, some of you have attended three, um, and this is certainly material that we cover both in, in the Quantum Leap level one and level two. Um, so apologies if, if people are seeing any of these slides or, or hearing stories uh, for a second time. But um, 
water obviously is is everywhere it's inside us it's in our crops it's in our stock it's in our pipes it's in our tanks and um, generally speaking um, either we have access to uh, water that is arising um, from deep sources naturally in, in springs and pools. This slide actually is the source of the River Thames uh, that gets big and, and runs through London in England and um, has, has helped, helped this British nation be uh, whatever it is or was. Um, so we have locations where the water naturally comes to the surface. Um, sometimes um, this is what we would call primary water, water that seems to be arising from deep sources and uh, under pressure uh, coming up to ground as much um, as possibly can, similar to the artesian uh, basin that you have there in Australia. Sometimes these are more um, uh, rainfall sourced um, ponds or pools that uh, will therefore only have seasonal value. Um, of course, we're familiar with having to go find water uh, if we don't have uh, natural surface water sources on our property. And then I know a number of you will uh, wisely call in a dazzer to um, to have a look see where that might be. Um, dowsing for water as well as dowsing for minerals uh, is one of the oldest uh, documented and most widely uh, used um, techniques for finding water and, and applications for dowsing. Um, and uh, certainly I've, I've had a look at, at a number of, of properties looking for water and, and spotting wells both in Australia and around elsewhere, that's certainly one of the things that people know DAS is for and, um, and want them to come and do. And then following the DASR, uh, much more sophisticated equipment gets involved at the end of which uh, hopefully we have a well. I haven't yet seen um, an Australian farm with a, a bucket like this. Um, more typically we're looking of course at, uh, at modern, modern pumping technology. But either way, we need the water um, and the dowsing can find us, find us the water and uh, direct us both to the flow rate available uh, to recover following a drill as well as indicate the quality of water that we'll, we'll access and the depth that we'll have to go. So, so um, Stories relating to water, um, there's a couple of uh, different angles to working with water, um, maybe three angles. The, um, the first thing that I want to discuss is just the generic blessing of water. And blessing, in my understanding, in my terminology, is where we confer in a very positively expressive um, fashion an unconditional love towards a thing. Um, it's unconditional positive witness, it's appreciation, it's gratitude, a deep sense of love, uh, for some of us perhaps a deep, deep sense of reverence, um, but an un unconditional uh, witness of that. Um, once we add condition, once we add specific intention uh, to our desire or to our, our, pro our projection of our mind, then uh, we're doing something more specific. We're introducing our own agenda. We're making a request for a particular outcome. Um, and those are uh, often highly desirable and, and fully legitimate. And the, the techniques for um, uh, carefully worded and accurately placed intention is, is certainly something that we spend a lot of time on uh, during the quantum leap programs because that's really we're using we're learning how to use the power and capacity of our mind um, as a freebie much like sunlight in an agricultural or, or other system so the blessing of water is is an ancient uh, and perhaps universal um, 
practice, we're seeing here um, an African uh, environment here. We've got a new well that's been put in and um, a very simple uh, ceremony of, of blessing is happening here. This is a little more uh, dramatic and evocative perhaps. Um, I only have 25 kilograms of uh, luggage when I travel around to Australia, so generally leave the robes behind. Um, although, in all honesty, robes not, robes not necessary. But around the world we find a very strong tradition of water blessing. And the water water absorbs whatever it's exposed to. We know it as a as a solvent, uh, it absorbs obviously uh, chemical and physical substance, um, but water is receptive to the vibrations and frequencies that we project from our minds uh, when we when we do that. Uh, what we're seeing here, a familiar slide to those of you who've studied with me already, the basic Schumann resonance this um, vibration of 7.83 cycles per second or hertz. This is the background frequency that is loudest in the natural frequency set on, on our planet. Um, our atmosphere is full of this resonance and it's the midpoint exactly of the four octaves that our brains cycle over. So this is the sort of carrier wave uh, with which we can interface with our environment. Um, waves and frequencies that we generate inside of our brain then project outside, um, no particular limit in time and space. Um, these are electromagnetic resonances, just the same as sunlight, just the same as radio or microwave. Um, they'll certainly carry as far as any object within your visual focus and with a little practice you can project um, your resonance to anything that you can hold clearly in your mind. So, Excuse me, Patrick. Patrick, yeah. just to interrupt you, just didn't catch that last... Um last 10 to 15 seconds it broke up a bit there. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So, um, just reviewing, um, speaking to a simple practice here of um, holding our focus on the object of our of our projected uh, intention here, in, in this case our water source, um, and then filling our heart as much love as we can and letting that move um, out towards the uh, subject of our focus, just as we would with a child or a close friend or family member, uh, really projecting our unconditional love strongly um, uh, to the focal point. Um, again, this is a slide that people who've studied with me will be quite familiar, but it's, it's one that shows how there are literally different frequency signatures or wave shapes for the different emotions uh, that, that people experience and project. And that wave shape at the bottom, the one that's related to the golden ratio, um, is the love wave, is the one that we're, we're looking for in this particular regard. Now, I think one of the most exciting things that's happened during my lifetime um, is the development of this technique of photographing water crystals so that we can clearly see the changes in coherence, particularly, um, that occurs when water picks up and is imbued by uh, different human emotions. So, uh, just reading the text here, because uh, it's kind of small on screen, the photo on the left is of an ice crystal frozen from severely polluted water. The photo on the right is the same water, refrozen after having been blessed. Um, this is by Dr. Omoto, who is a Japanese gentleman who's developed this particular photographic technology 
uh, where water is photographed very, very close to its crystal state, just as it emerges into a liquid state, and then we can clearly see the pattern that it's carrying. So these photographs have very clearly shown to us um, extraordinarily how much water absorbs human emotion. We have um, two or three or four slides here that I wanted to share with you because I think looking at this and getting a sense, again, those top two images, the water on the left may or may not be what the water looks like coming out of the tap in your house or, um, or the pipe feeding the trough uh, to your cattle or sheep. Um, clearly, the picture on the right, after offering a prayer, that looks like healthier water. It's certainly got a high level of coherence and fractality, which we would generally associate with a state of, of health and, um, and dynamism. The uh, picture bottom left, I would particularly draw to your, to your attention. Um, that is the pattern held in water after it's been uh, given appreciation and gratitude. And um, also, again, those of you who've, who've been with us in the Quantum Leap programs, I tend to emphasize gratitude as one of the easiest ways to get our mind into the zone, if, if you will, or, or a grace state in order to transfer um, unconditional love or a blessing. Um, it's quite easy for us to find something that we're genuinely grateful for and focus on that and move in, 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 in that direction. Uh, I think uh, very instructively that central bottom slide, you make me sick, I will kill you, uh, projecting hate and anger and rage into water, you can see, um, makes it lose coherence, makes it lose pattern, um, and moves away from that dynamic fractal quality uh, that we're looking for. Many, many pictures of this. You can pick up books, and I'd certainly encourage you to do so. Uh, Dr. Remoto is, is the chap's name, but just spending a few minutes, I think, looking at, at what love and prayer and positive intention will do uh, really says more than I can cover with any number of words on the webinar. So we'll just have, have a, few, a few more of these. Um, Music and sound, as well as human thought and feelings, obviously uh, are, are absorbed into the matrix of water and then carried onwards as pattern from there. Um, and again, we see, uh, I don't have any particular comment on the heavy metal music at the bottom. Um, it doesn't look quite so fun as, as, as Bach there. Um, but we could do a more thorough exploration of um, what your favorite music looks like um, in the water around you. This, of course, includes the water inside of our system. We want to remember that whatever we hold in mind and hold in heart and thought and feeling and project, we're also projecting internally. And so the liquid matrix of our consciousness, um, intracellularly, extracellularly, uh, in our in our neural tissue, the thoughts and feelings that we have are also changing the patterns of our intracellular water, I believe. Um, harder to photograph, but um, I think the uh, the consequence um, is apparent when you when you think that one on through. And more of the same. So then the question is, apart from the beauty of uh, of the water crystals and um, the revelation of how much our thoughts and feelings can impact them, uh, the question is how much of a difference does this make actually in in our world, in our life, um, in, our, in our daily practice. And um, many stories relating to this, Dr. Emoto um, himself and experiments repeated by many of us uh, over and over and easily repeated by yourselves at home on the kitchen table and a, a great family project is to um, take sprouts and um, two or three trays of them and then water them uh, equally over the same period of a week or two 
um, one tray with water that is um, thoroughly blessed and loved up as best as you can, and one tray uh, watered by water that has uh, no particular treatment, and then you can do a third tray uh, if you choose um, with negative emotions expressed um, in, into the water that those seedlings are, uh, are watered by. I would say um, any time I've invited people to do this experiment, I find it very hard to get anybody to hate water. Um, once they've seen the pictures we just looked at and, and, and heard the stories onwards, um, it sort of goes against the grain to express negative emotion of any kind into water. So normally people are just doing a comparison on, on a neutral uh, water source and then comparing that with one that's been thoroughly blessed. And typically people report that after a, after a, a period of germination, germination sufficient to establish uh, roots and shoots, um, that there's uh, between a 10 and a 30% uh, increase in the, uh, the germinated mass of seedlings that have been watered um, with, with blessed water. And there's such a long tradition of holy water and uh, water blessings um, that I suspect that this is, this is not new technology or new understanding. Uh, this increase in health and vitality, uh, germination, growth and yield simply by by thoroughly blessing uh, the water involved, also in a more general sense, uh, blessing the fields, blessing the crops, um, blessing the farm in, in general will, will also have beneficial effect. But even just working with the water, with trays of sprouting seeds on the kitchen table, you should be able to fairly quickly establish a difference in, in growth rate and uh, yield outcome that then becomes a very positive encouragement um, <clears throat> to going out and applying uh, the same thing then into the water troughs, into the water tank, into the borehole, um, really any, any water infrastructure that you have on the farm. Also if you want you can get quite competitive within the family and see which which whose whose tray of sprites does best, and who can uh, who can put the most amount of love into the water that you're using? A uh, story that I love to share here that came from uh, New South Wales from an RCS client and um, and good friend. Uh, we had a field day and blessed the borehole that um, disseminated water to half of the paddocks uh, on this uh, property carrying sheep at the time. The other half of the paddocks, um, the water source uh, was dams, is, is dams in, in, in those fields. And the gentleman concerned had, had observed that the sheep had a slight preference towards trough water over dam water, not greatly, but, but, but slightly and noticeably. And so during this field day, one of the things we did was, was give a thorough blessing to the borehole. And we did a before taste and we did an after taste and we were all quite convinced that the water tasted significantly uh, improved to us, uh, to our palate, um, in terms of um, flavor and, uh, and texture also. And so we were pleased with ourselves on, on that account. But then um, subsequently, news was that uh, the sheep started immediately to show an extraordinary preference for this now blessed water um, that was uh, coming into their troughs and that when let out of a dam watered field and into a trough watered field the mob would gallop, uh, would run up to 1.2 kilometers straight to the trough um, to uh, get access to that water there. And this continued apparently for about six months until I got back to the farm uh, for a review visit on which occasion we blessed all of the dams and at that point the sheep went back to showing little preference um, and uh, not, not running to troughs, not running to dams, more or less equally happy with each source. So there's no doubt that your stock um, can pick up the difference. and. Um, we're developing a, a 
baselining measurement of how well you can less water within within the RCS program as to how fast you can get sheep to run um, ultimately to the trough. So we would be looking for um, we'd be looking for increased stock health, increased stock water take take up. Um, we would hope and aspire certainly that that would spill over into general health weight gain and also uh, increases in fertility um, if all of the system is working well. So we can imprint water um, with our love and, uh, and bless it in this way. I'd also like to move on while we have time here to a couple of other issues uh, with water. Now, one is that um, as well as absorbing our, uh, our human energy, extraordinarily, and this is certainly one of the things that has uh, reshuffled my uh, beliefs and experience around the world, uh, about the world, is the capacity of water to actually uh, respond to human intention. Um, as an elemental force, as a consciousness of its own. And what I would share in that regard, my first experience personally with this was of a shallow spring in the woods, much like the one that we're seeing in the slide here, that was feeding a friend's house in Vermont and that went dry during a drought a number of years ago. And uh, the location of this person's home and the location particularly of the, uh, the spring source uh, meant that it was going to be very, very difficult to establish another source of water, no real access for a drilling rig, um, and uh, no obvious opportunity to, uh, to tap into other water sources. So she'd asked me to come and look at this, and I went and looked, and there was a dry hole where once the water had been. And I was inspired uh, when tuning into the situation to pray and bless and sing to the water or to the spirit of the, the spring, the spirit of the water, even though the water apparently and clearly at the time was not there. So I did that and nobody was looking so I didn't care too much. Um, but then I heard within 24 hours the water would come back into the spring without any rain event. and. I thought that, that was cool and I also thought that was a bit amazing because we're taught in high school physics, at least where I went to high school, that water has an exclusively gravitational uh, motion and they didn't mention water changing its course underground um, or somehow moving against gravity or redirecting itself to fill up a dry hole that had once carried water before. So I was most amazed with this and I was encouraged to try the same thing on a, a second similar uh, shallow spring that had gone dry and sure enough the same thing happened after a cycle of prayer and blessing. The water came back and uh, filled up the spring again and then within days, this was all very remarkable for me at the time, uh, I was visiting another client to do unrelated work. Um, but she said over a cup of tea at the end of the, the consult is, by the way, I had this most extraordinary experience. My, my spring went dry and I was moved to sing to it and the water came back into it. And so from my own experience and direct contact with clients who tried the same, I, I realized uh, that water could and would in fact respond directly uh, to our requests. Um, Looking a little further, I then discovered the depth of um, how far this knowledge and experience goes, at least in folk tradition and cultural memory. Um, in England, we have what are called well-dressing ceremonies. And I think uh, back in the day they were universal. Um, now they're retained folk. Uh, traditions that a number of towns do support. This one is in uh, Bisley uh, in Gloucestershire, just 10-15 uh, minutes from where I'm speaking to you now. And they have annual ceremonies where they garland their wells and springs with flowers, sometimes simple and elegant, like this one. 
um, sometimes, uh, as, as with this, these guys are going to dance the maypole, I think, around their fountain. Some of them are extraordinarily, um, extraordinarily lavish, and the whole town and the kids go to, uh, go to great lengths to create garlands and um, floats and displays, mostly using, mostly using flowers, it seems to be the tradition. And they have dance, and they have song, and they have prayer, and they have blessing. And this is a once a year um, uh, ritual in these traditional townships. And so the water is, is getting reaffirmed, the relationship with water is getting reaffirmed, and the water is being re-blessed, as it were, on, on an annual basis. And with the knowledge now that we have of, of, of how the crystalline structure changes with human uh, love and emotion, as well as how uh, water can actually move itself towards us uh, by our request, uh, this suddenly looks like a very profound technology rather than a naive um, superstition. Uh, and so I think I, w I would just mention in that regard that most, most of the folk traditions and I think most of our traditional religious religious ritual has its origin in um, very practical applications in agriculture particularly um, of of the consequence of, of human love and prayer and the knowledge of the consequences of that and then the embodiment into uh, routine practice to ensure in this case that the water will come and that the water that comes will be healthy and um, and support our lives in every way. Um, this is the third point that I wanted uh, to make about water is that we've we've talked about blessing it in a very unconditionally loving way. We've talked about making requests to it um, and having it respond to us uh, apparently from its own volition um, in some mysterious. Uh, and miraculous fashion, but we can also put very specific intention into water, um, declared intention for some specific and particular outcome uh, of desire. And I would always start by blessing um, unconditionally and using that as a carrier wave, as it were, and establishing rapport and getting coherence into the water. But then once that's established, I think we can direct a very particular and specific intention um, as, 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 as an informational package, uh, perhaps, uh, into the water uh, on, on, on top of what we've already done. And an example that I, I have from my own personal experience is working to increase uh, potato yield using water as a medium to carry um, the particular intentions around uh, around the potato produce I would just warn those people uh, considering trying this for themselves that you may encounter transportation and storage problems uh, with your crops if if you if you are successful in this way. So, but specifically, what we did um, we inventoried a list. Um, of uh, all of the things that we thought would be happy for a potato. Potatoes are one of our highest value crops in the UK, and so there's a lot of attention uh, given to, to the potato harvest, even above uh, grain and cereal crops. And what we did here was, so we made our list of everything we thought a potato would like um, in terms of nutrients in terms of uh, soil conditions, in terms of energetic conditions, um, in terms of weather conditions. And we put that informational package almost like a, a file transfer that one would do between computers. Uh, we transferred that very clear intention uh, from our mind into a small bottle of water sterilized with a, a small amount of alcohol just to keep the, the water clean and fresh and, and free from, from fungal growth or, uh, or other contaminants. And so really this was like an informational package, very, very densely filled 
um, uh, potato nutrient brew, as it were. Nothing physically in it except a little whiskey and tap water, um, but very richly filled uh, with our intention as well as the carrier wave of unconditional love. What we did then was we put three drops only uh, from this bottle uh, per 90 liters of water uh, into the spray tank that was applying um, uh, this and other nutrients at point of planting uh, to the potato crop in question on this farm. And the uh, result that we got was uh, very, very dramatic. Uh, we got slightly better and worse results uh, field by field and um, uh, tuber species by tuber species. This was uh, one of our best results. You can see here that the yield increasing from the green untreated at uh, 21 tons per acre um, to the blue. We, we called our brew dolomite uh, because one of the things we were putting in was the essence of uh, dolomitic limestone, which is considered to be uh, particularly high in uh, life force or energetic vibration. So we called our, our treatment dolomite, and you can see here that we, we got an extra six tons per acre uh, on this. This was in a season where we were getting about 100 pounds sterling per ton for potatoes, and the net effect of this um, was a little inside of 100,000. Uh, extra pounds to this farm's budget on that year. The uh, the orange uh, graph on the, the right-hand side, they were also trialing a, a natural uh, fungicide called Beald, um, which in, in our trial didn't, didn't perform quite so well, as you can see. It was a very useful product, but it slightly delayed uh, the progression of the, um, of the tuber, so it, it shows up low on the graph. Uh, we put our, um, the uh, field agronomist who was working with the farm was very intrigued um, with what we'd done and managed to get us included into the national trial, Potatoes in Practice, um, run by a, a conventional research uh, institute. And here you can see uh, multiple test plots uh, trialing different chemistry and different tubers. We were thrilled when the results of this came back in and we saw that we had the highest gross yield and also the highest 45 to 80 millimeter tuber uh, size yield, uh, which is the highest value uh, tuber size uh, here in the UK at, at point of sale. And uh, we, we, we got, as I say, we got within the category of, um, of the trial that we were in, the under the soil treatments. Um, comparing against the uh, the various chemical application standard of the day, this was 2010 was the trial, 2010-2011, um, uh, we, we we came in with the highest highest yields compared with the chemistry. So we know not only that this works, but we know at least in this trial in this context that actually this works better than the conventionally applied uh, agronomy of our, uh, of our current, current pharmaceutical practices. So I think very reassuring, therefore, for those of you considering trying this at home, um, your own love in a bottle is, is quite possibly more valuable um, than anything that you can buy in a bottle. Uh, we, like, we like that thought. So water, um, we've, we've looked at those three issues then, um, the unconditional blessing of water and the increasing of, of coherence and vitality within it. Um, definitely we want to try that with the sprouts on the kitchen table um, because there's much more power in individuals seeing this working for themselves. Uh, than in just listening to my stories. And a quick, simple experiment at home will, will give you a lifetime's worth of, uh, of excitement and um, inspiration, hopefully. Um, I would start with unconditional love as a practice. Um, if it looks good on your sprites on a kitchen table, then definitely go and bless everything that you can find as a source of water. 
Um, I personally find it more efficient to um, bless the water back as far as possible to point of origin. Um, I think a truly unconditional loving blessing you can apply anywhere, anytime. Um, once you get into specific intention, it's important to keep that on your own property. Um, the uh, ethics around working with subtle energies are that uh, we're not allowed to do anything that uh, compromises another person's free will. And so once we start to add specific outcome-based intention, we want to keep that on our own property. But with unconditional love, um, I think that we can apply that uh, anywhere at all. A, a nice example of this in, in a very general and community sense was uh, a very inspired and enthusiastic gentleman that I came across about 15 years ago. And he was concerned at the uh, status of the town that he lived in, a town called Dundee on the east coast of Scotland, which once had been a, a boom town based on uh, fishing and a, a very substantial whaling fleet and all of the uh, related industries that went with that, massive amounts of jute uh, being manufactured uh, into ropes and sailcloth and shipbuilding and so forth. And when whaling had gone out, um, then pretty much the economic engine of this town had died and it had gone into uh, great social decline as well as economic decline and was considered a bit of an armpit of the area. And so this gentleman wants to see what he could do uh, with the tools at hand for, for himself. And um, his technique was to, to bless uh, small pebbles uh, very, very thoroughly. And um, once he blessed his pebbles, he solemnly went around. And it took him two or three months, I think, uh, to get to all the different locations. We, he, he went around all of the water sources uh, springs and ponds and um, and uh, places where snow melted in mountains and he, he distributed his little pebbles in, in all of these locations and he was convinced that by the end of the, the time that he'd done this um, that uh, holy water was coming out of everybody's tap in, uh, in downtown Dundee. And I can't say directly how, how much of an effect it made, but the truth is that Dundee has, in fact, made an extraordinary, <laughs> extraordinary economic recovery and is now quite a, a thriving uh, little boom town. The government gave great tax incentives to move new industry there also, um, and so there's, there's lots of things in the 3D and social and economic environment that are supported also. Um, but I always wonder how much of a difference actually right at the beginning of, of, of the recovery, this, this basic blessing of, of the town's water and the water in and under the town and everything that everybody was drinking. Um, perhaps they were, they were having holy cups of tea and uh, getting thoroughly inspired as to how to bring their town back together. So I would, I would say in terms of application back at home, um, bless the sources of the water and maybe build that into the family culture as, as is traditional practice to do something on an annual basis. Bless it at Christmas or bless it on Dad's birthday or bless it on the anniversary of purchasing a farm or, or bless it on the first convenient day you don't have anything else to do. But, but do go ahead and bless it. Um, you can bless the water in your teacup or you can bless the borehole that that feeds the whole farm, or maybe you can go and bless the reservoir um, that's, uh, that's sourcing water from your whole township. And as I say, I think as long as we stay with unconditional love, we can go and bless anything that we want. As, as soon as we add specific intention, we need to keep that on our own property. Um, but in terms of, of the unconditional uh, blessing, I think um, there can truly be an advantage to going after um, whatever you can identify as, as the ultimate source of your own water there, whether that's water that's going on crops or stock or uh, feeding your children or, uh, or feeding your industrial process, um, uh, as I say, domestic, commercial, 
industrial, agricultural, we, we use water all, all, all the time for everything and particularly, of course, including for ourselves. So that was what I wanted to share. Um, as I said earlier, we, we definitely cover this um, material in, in both the level one and level two quantum leap programs. Um, it's, it's an easy one to access and we get some great stories coming back. Uh, algae disappearing from uh, water troughs after adding drops of water. Uh, we, we generally go home with a bottle of blessed water at the end of uh, both level one and level two that we've had the whole group actively energize and uh, yeah, as I say, we, we, we do get some great stories back as to what happened on the farm when when it got put into the trough or, or added to the storage tank or uh, or just dropped into a into a, a liquid spray that was otherwise going on to a crop. So I'll stop talking there. I think we've been going about 45 minutes. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got some questions, and we'll, we'll hear back from Billy here. Yeah, thank you very much. That was that was fantastic. Uh, I see you again there on the screen. Great. We do have a number of questions that have come up throughout, and uh, we'll go to some of those now. We've got. Um, Kelly in New South Wales was wondering uh, whether there's a difference that can be created by animals in water. For example, there's uh, a trough in the yards um, that has stressed animals around it compared to a trough in a paddock or field that has content animals using it. And can, yeah, can that difference be created by the animals? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I. I would assume that it can. Um, I, 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 I think perhaps I haven't considered that angle before. Um, I, I would love to get Dr. Emoto to, <laughs> to, 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 to tell us whether a stressed animal would uh, have a negative impact on the water. I would assume it would. I would assume it would. Um, and perhaps, I, yeah, a bit further on the, that, yeah, because Kelly's mentioned that um, they have got a trough in the yards that's never clear, and yet there are other, all the other paddock troughs are clear, and it's the same source, water source. Mm -hmm. So she's trying to sort of work, yeah, sort of work through that. I, 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 if I was, if I was there and looking at it, I, I think I would, I would first look for other sources of energetic contamination than the animals. Um, Anything's possible, as I say. I haven't considered that directly, but I, I would say I don't normally pick up animals as a source of uh, negative vibration into the landscape. They, they seem to me more to reflect um, what's present atmospherically. So if the animals are stressed in the yard and the water is is not in good shape, I would I would bless the yard. Um, and if, if I was personally on the job, I, I would look for sources of stress or disharmony um, in the landscape, whether there's uh, residual human energy, whether there's uh, some kind of trauma pattern that's gotten established into the landscape that's both uh, spoiling the water quality and stressing the animals. That would be my assumption, but obviously without, without being on my location, I couldn't say, but I would Kelly at home just try try blessing everything um, and and if if the animals de-stress and, and the water clears then you'll you'll know you've you've done a good job and hit home with that. Mm. Thank you, Patrick. Um, uh, Nathan is wondering what out of interest what song you sing when you're blessing water sources. <laughs> um, well, that's propriety knowledge, of course. Um, no, honestly. Uh, what I do is um, I, I open my mouth and connect to my heart and let out whatever joyous noise comes forth. And I'm, I'm reassured that that in the Scandinavian tradition is called yoiking. And I think maybe that's close to the yodeling of the, uh, the Alpine tradition. But what yoiking is, is, is a tuning into the landscape and then a singing of the landscape through the human voice. So it, it can sound very chaotic. It can be a, a simple chant or a repetitive series of notes. Um, probably not something that we would be uh, be publishing for mainstream uh, consumption or, or, or putting into the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> um, 
but really it's it's just a vocalization of of one's one's feelings and an expression um, of one's rapport with landscape. So it really doesn't matter what it sounds like. I believe it's just it's a it's a moving of energy through the human voice. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, one of our uh, participants is wondering whether you've had anything to do with biodynamics and the stirring of water to create vortexes before using it to put um, biodynamic preparations out. Yes, excellent question again. I, I think I think this is exactly what is happening um, with the with the preparation of of the biodynamic um, applications and the prolonged nature of the stirring gives us plenty of time really to, to enter into a, a meditative state and get a very, very deep rapport personally uh, with the liquid as we stir. And clearly in that regard, uh, with the biodynamic preps, we're not only being unconditionally loving, but we are uh, deliberately channeling specific cosmic uh, forces into the water, into the liquid um, medium. Um, slightly differently depending on, on which preparation um, is being created. But there, I think, a very nice example of both an unconditional love and time with human attention and, and a clear and specific idea about uh, what that preparation is, is going to have uh, particular use and value for. So I think that's, that, that's a perfect example of, uh, of exactly the, 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 the the matter in hand. Mm. Mm, right. Um, thank you. And, and uh, Hoag's in Victoria. Ho thank you, Patrick. Hoag's in Victoria uh, was wondering whether running water through a magnetic field uh, and returning the water to a magnetic charge is of benefit to us. Um, does it improve the quality of the water or do we simply need to bless it? Um, I, I think that uh, Different situations um, probably call forth different applications. I know there's huge benefits um, with running water through magnetic fields in terms of, of solubilizing um, mineral content and um, avoiding the buildup of, of uh, scale in um, in water systems. Um, so I, I've I've seen a lot of people with magnets on, on, on water sources and, and very happy with them. The other thing that's just come onto the market um, last year is a radio frequency um, device that can be attached uh, like a magnet clamped around a hose and um, that's been developed in Ireland um, and uh, now brought onto commercial market and almost identical to the to the results that I've seen with water blessing um, they're getting increased yields I'm not greatly excited by that exclusively because they're using a single frequency um, whereas I think the human mind can generate a very complex and rich frequency set um, but I'm excited that the science is showing that pure frequency uh, when put into water uh, does have have this beneficial effect. I can't remember what frequency they've used, but you'll, you'll find that quickly and easily um, if, if you look that up. So say, I think the human mind can do a better job than that. Um, but in terms of either or, I think uh, different situations call for different applications. And I would always base, uh, you know, practical decisions on, on practical results. Um, it's, it's easy to bless the water. If that gives you the result uh, that you need, then you're in good shape. If the magnets give you an extra, an extra hand with a job, that's great, or, or they may do something that you don't want to have to be concerned with. Uh, I, I certainly wouldn't think either or, but uh, see, see what's most beneficial, either on its own or in combination, and, and, and go with that, I think. Mm. Thanks, Patrick. Um, a couple of questions around rain. Um, somebody was wondering, um, can you bless rain and inject a mental picture of what the grass requires as the rain falls and perhaps get a, a better response from the rain? I love these questions. <laughs> um, uh, 
definitely uh, during the Quantum Leap programs, we talk quite a bit about uh, working with with the weather elementals, and um, um, certainly there is an enormous capacity, I think, for us to beneficially influence the the atmospheric environment of our uh, farm and property as as well as the the terrestrial terrain and in the traditional uh, European uh, esoteric system there are four elements the elements as we're familiar earth air and fire and water and each of those is considered to be uh, an interactive uh, consciousness of itself and so obviously we've been talking exclusively about water as an element here today um, but air and the consciousness of atmosphere and the capacity, capacity to influence weather uh, patterns, uh, certainly at, at least at a local level, is very well proven and well established um, and something that, uh, that I think is, is another benefit. It, it clearly overlaps with, um, we're looking for water particularly, we're also looking for sunlight and and, and benevolent uh, conditions in every regard. Um, so I would say yes, definitely uh, bless the rain, bless the sky, bless the atmosphere, and um, and also just to bear in mind as as we do that, we're we're also moving into uh, to issues of of, of weather control, um, which uh, uh, is 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 the next module after a cup of tea. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, and uh, also, Hoax is asking, where we're using rainwater, do we bless the tanks that the water is stored in? Yeah, great question. Um, yes, I think if, if, if that's your source, then absolutely bless, bless the storage tank. And um, I just did that in Adelaide um, a handful of weeks ago. and. Um, they had been, uh, clients had, had been on a quantum leap workshop, taken water home, put it into the rainwater storage tank, thrilled at the uh, taste and texture uh, difference, um, very impressed with that. And they said that over the period of about a year, it was still tasting good, but it wasn't tasting as good as it had been after the first application. Uh, and they'd been holding off uh, reapplying until I got there so that we could we could have it as a trial on a field day, which we had there. And uh, we went ahead and, and, and blessed the rainwater tank again. And um, uh, one of the, the nicest things of the day was a, a master sommelier turned uh, wine grower was there uh, with us. And he was able to, to give us a full um, wine speak uh, description of the before and after blessing uh, taste, flavor, and uh, nose and texture of the water but absolutely that was that was blessing um, uh, a rainwater catchment tank and so probably in that situation as, as as I suspect with all it's it's good to think of this as something that we do either daily or monthly or yearly or any time we think about it uh, rather than just as as a one-off and, and, and assume that it's going to be good forever Mm, mm, thank you. Um, we've run out of time for more questions, but I, what I might do, Patrick, is, um, is send you one or two that I have that we didn't get to answer so we can get those answers to those people, if that's all right, so we can finish yeah. on time today. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, uh, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we've had people, we've got people right now with us from Western Australia, Victoria, Queensland, and New South Wales, so that's uh, fantastic. Um, the questions have been great and we really appreciate Patrick you taking time to enlighten us and give us some really helpful um, learnings and information about uh, the blessing of water. Um, there's applications with germination, fertility, yield um, and its capacity to respond to human intentions so that's been really wonderful. Um, I'll just mention to everyone while we're together that um, the early bird for Quantum Leap Level 2 
closes tomorrow at five o'clock, uh, and that's Patrick's coming back to join us in in uh, Australia next month, and he'll be delivering level two workshops. So if you've already done that, there's a special repeat price, um, or if you've done level one, come along to level two. Um, we've also, for those in the Stanthorpe area, got a little mini workshop on the morning of Saturday the 13th of September and there'll be an email with that information on it going out to you shortly. Um, I believe that's for real. Thank you so much, Patrick, for joining us from the UK. Thank you. We look forward to having you back here next month. And, um, and again, thanks to everyone for participating and joining us today. Great. Getting some lovely thank you comments coming back, Patrick. So <laughs> thank you everybody once again and uh, and we'll be in touch. Thank you.